the screen for some comments or questions. Yeah, I think we can do that. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Happy Monday. I know it's the end of the semester and that we're all having Mondays, um, but I'm thankful that you all are here. Um, and to our kind of our teaching, which is titled Queering Pedagogy in and out of the classroom. Um, what we have for you today is a set of lightning talks by um, some folks who think about queer pedagogy. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about what queer pedagogy even is um, in a second. Uh, but I hope that today that we'll have these kind of three very short two to three minute kind of maybe three to five minute talks that kind of share how we operationalize tenets of queer pedagogy. So, um, and one of the first things I want to mention is that you know, queer pedagogy or queering pedagogy uh, is not just for queer teachers and not just for queer students, just like a feminist pedagogy or an equity-based pedagogy or an anti-racist pedagogy. It's all about kind of thinking about equity in very intentional and deliberate ways. Uh, so we'll kind of talk through some of these things today. Oh, there's lots of animation. So we have some terms here. We're not going to go through these, but we just wanted to kind of identify them because um, you might hear some of these across. Um, we'll also get, uh, we'll share the slides and some resources. And as y'all are joining, feel free to grab food. And this is relatively informal. Um, but we just wanted to kind of share some kind of key ideas. I think one of the things that's important to kind of underscore is the distinction between um, sex and gender and how these things are different, right? One is social, one's biological, and how those things kind of play together. Um, and if you have any questions about these, at the end we can return to the slide and we can talk through any of these kinds of questions. So I wanted to start with a quote from one of my old professors, Jackie Rhodes, in her video, The Failure of a Queer Pedagogy. So I'll just read this and unpack it. She writes, can such a queer pedagogy even exist? For pedagogy is about disciplining the subject. Pedagogy is a heterosex political indoctrination in service of a heterosex institutional imperative. The queer challenges such disciplining, such assimilation, and resists the demarcation of acceptable and unacceptable, of appropriate and inappropriate, and the struggle against the confines of capital P pedagogy, which is informed by a logic of mastery. So when Rhodes kind of talks about this idea of queer and pedagogy as kind of in service of different aims, uh, I think it's really important to kind of first unpack this word queer, which actually in its definition is kind of undefinable. That's kind of the point of it. Um, the point of queering is to disrupt the status quo or disrupt the ways that we tend to do things. Um, just like queer people have to disrupt you know, heteronormative systems. Um, and really thinking about pedagogy as kind of a, a state-sponsored uh, way in which power is enacted. So thinking about these two things together is kind of what we'll, we'll share a bit today. So we have a couple of tenets of queer pedagogy. Um, so centering principles of queerness in our teaching, um, and that's really kind of important. And this extends to administration. If you do a lot of leadership work, thinking about uh, collaboration or affirming different people's experiences, these are all kind of part of um, what a querying might be. A second part of this is to build community and to build community sometimes in different ways than we would expect. And last is to disrupt the status quo. I think that's really at the core of this is to think about queer pedagogy is really about fucking shit up and really thinking about how we can um, build a better world. Uh, one of my favorite queer theorists is Jose Esteban Munoz, and he has a book called um, Cruising Utopia. And in that book, he kind of says that queerness has not yet arrived, that we're working towards queerness, we're working towards utopia. Um, it's kind of similar to like radical imaginations and uh, the black radical tradition. So I think about those two things together. So here are just some tips broadly conceived that we can think a little bit about. Um, can you want me to go? All right. 
so the first is to kind of reflect on your self-awareness and your personal experiences that influence your value systems, right? We're all socialized through interlocking systems of power, and those show up in the ways that we move through the world, how we think, how we teach, how we work together. Um, so interrogating those things, and um, that might also be gender include, that might also be race, right? So I like to think about my, how, my, how do my whiteness and my queerness interact, and how does that shape how I move through the world? Uh, enhance your knowledge of queer history and current events that influence populations and students. I think this is really important where we're having, we're in an age of anti-trans laws being passed, we're in an age of don't say gay, we're kind of taking quite a few steps back uh, politically in these areas, so understanding that these don't just live in a vacuum, that these are part of a broader history of ideas. Uh, use inclusive language when talk to large groups. One of the things I always have to catch myself on is saying, hey guys, but we usually say, hey y'all, or you're right, that kind of, that small shift can, can mean a lot. Um, change your signature line, your Zoom name to include pronouns. Uh, use, choose names and pronouns on rosters and roll call. Uh, and include except, uh, inclusive syllabi language. Um, often the syllabus can be a place of a lot of corporeal and, um, punishment in lots of ways. You must do this. You need to do this. If you, if you reframe that, um, that can be a really kind of awesome way to do that. So this is kind of a little um, overview. And you know we kind of have this little mantra here. Everyone deserves to be loved, accepted, and valued um, as kind of a way to think about it. So I, my little lightning talk is really about kind of talking about queer protest in the gen ed curriculum. Uh, so my appointment right now is in English. And I direct the writing program, which is you know, English 101 and 102 sequence. Um, and a lot of the ways I think about this is I teach my Comp 2 class, which is a research seminar focus course, on understanding the histories of writing as protest. Um, and so I kind of title it Writing Justice, Publics, Protest, and Resistance. And so the kind of the core content in the course is for students to study groups like the Kambahi River Collective, which was a group of black lesbian feminists in the 1970s, 1980s, who wrote, a, I think, one of the most important pieces of public writing, which is a black feminist statement. And it's an articulation of politics um, for coalitional work. So we really kind of focus on this uh, in the course. So um, really the, the takeaway I hope you take from this is that you can pull in, if you have you know, the creative liberties to do that, you can pull in queer history into a class you're teaching or into a session or um, in a reading. And these can be really useful uh, for students because often students don't think about these things, particularly in gen eds. Um, and so this is a really cool way to do it. So I'll just talk briefly about the course design and then I'll pass it off. Um, but basically, um, the first assignment what I have them do is a little um, archival activist analysis. So they look at, there's quite a few different um, pieces of public writing, some pamphlets from the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and they analyze kind of how do these particular groups of people um, try to get people to change their mind about things like, uh, black liberation, or things like gender and power, or queerness, or a disability, and all these different things. Um, the second project is a chance for them to kind of build a qualitative research project. So I kind of think about the classes past, present, and future. So the present is for them to identify a research question that has relevance around public writing, activism, protest, or resistance in the valley. Um, and then they build out a research question, and they collect data, and they do this as a collaborative web text. So um, they're learning a lot of different things there. And the last is kind of a return to that piece I was talking about in the, uh, a moment ago around queering utopias. Um, and I asked them to write something to a public about a transformed world or a utopia. So these are kinds of ways you can think about a broader course design that engages some of those principles of queer pedagogy. All right. I'm going to hand it off now to whoever's next. Fabulous.
Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Sandra Gavin. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm an assistant professor in counselor education. Um, I'm on about five hours of sleep. I had a significant layover in Denver and I didn't get home until 2.30 last night. So I'm going to fake it until you make it. Um, okay, so a little bit about just in general in counselor education. When we're teaching to uh, our students and training them, we really want them to be able to work with all walks of life when they leave our program. So they really need to increase their awareness, knowledge, skills in general, um, specifically to work with all populations. And so within that, what we really want to do is promote reflexivity. And so when I'm talking in the next couple of slides, I want you to be considering whether you're a faculty, an employee, um, a student, how you can be more reflexive in your practices in general as a human or even as an employee at the university. So in general, when you're thinking of some of these components, you really want to help um, students or yourself engage in critical thinking of why you do what you do. So what uh, Nick started alluding to there, those pieces of your family history, maybe your upbringing, how has that impacted your value systems? And how are you maybe potentially projecting that onto your students or your peers or your friends? So some things to be thinking about. Um, for me personally, in counselor education, so I have this teaching philosophy, um, an integrated approach. I really use a social constructivism and feminist type of approach. So what this means is um, I really support students in um, making meaning to the material. They're applying it to themselves. They're using reflexive work in that way. In addition to that, I view myself as a co-participant in that experience. I think of my students as experts in their own lived experiences that are going to contribute to the classroom environment. So I want to make sure I um, am making, making time and space to have those dialogues. So it's not a one-way dialogue, almost never is it even remotely that for more than like 20 minutes of my life in an hour and a half or three hour um, presentation or uh, class. Um, in general, when you're thinking of feminism and you're thinking of feminist theory, I think two of the core takeaways I want you to have is A, um, that you're really being aware of minority stress theory and its implicate and what it means. So if you haven't heard that term before, tr truly look into what minority stress theory is all about. It's in short kind of about how has um, social environments, et cetera, impacted the student, the person. Um, so that's be a very condensed way to talk about it. And also, how are we empowering our students or our peers or our friends or our colleagues? So in my classes, I specifically go out of my way to plant seeds of empowerment, whether I'm working with the student to do that or on behalf of the student to do that in a variety of whatever that would mean, of resources or whatever they could need at that time. Um, I have not looked at the slide once. So, um, uh, so making sure we're open and curious and flexible. So in my dissertation, I personally um, interviewed a lot of queer folks and a lot came out of, of it was when your supervisors were more open and curious and flexible to learning with um, with the person, then it really created that more brave space, that courageous conversations that need to be had. And if you, if you have that one-way dialogue and the students don't feel like you are open, curious, and non-judgmental, that's problematic and you're not going to get that um, experiential type of work that you need for them to grow. Good enough on this one. Okay, when you're looking at some of the activities I engage in, when, um, take a look and see what one maybe you could implement into your coursework or ones that you already do. Now you could maybe just do it more intentionally even. So I bring a lot of creativity and activism into my courses. So I teach a lot of like multicultural counseling. Uh, I um, built a counseling and LGBTQI plus community course, advanced multicultural at the doc level. So these are a lot of types of things that we do in a lot of these, especially master level courses. So the most common one that you all already know, films and movies that they can um, write reaction papers, they can share maybe their experience in applying within that. 
those type of pieces. But one I love doing in my ma master's class is an intersectionality collage and reflection assignment. So what I have them do is learn about intersectionality, what it is, and then um, they're gonna apply it to themselves by with a PowerPoint, with painting something, with putting, like I've had one person go to like um, a cliff and put like some type of like grass and so some native indigenous kind of root stuff together and then that's, it spoke to them as part of their identities. Um, and then the typical actual collage by paper, paste, um, magazines or images on there is the popular one. What I have them do is they, they create that assignment and then I have them share it with one of their peers, family, friends. They decide who they share that with. And it's actually a super vulnerable experience. Most of the time they talk in their, in their re, um, reaction papers of I had no idea how vulnerable it was going to be even though I just shared it with my husband. Um, so, um, so that's something you want to know if you decide to have them share it with another human, give them that maybe that warning as well. But I think it's something that really helps them in learning about themselves and now they can also apply that to whatever their profession is and how that is, could potentially impact their work. Oh, I'm moving slides. Um, other ones, there's an I am poem, that's a super popular one. You usually can write um, about yourself, your experiences, and um, you can Google that one. I don't, know, I don't got much to say with that one, but that's common. Uh, <laughs> in my uh, Counseling LGBTQI Plus community course, I actually do developmental por portfolios. So we do lots of different assignments in that class, a safe zone ally training, we do, um, the intersectionality collage, lots of uh, case study kind of vignettes, all those type of things. Um, and I have them write a developmental portfolio about how they grew personally and how they grew professionally. And then specifically talking about particular modules, topics, or assignments that impacted that. So that's one I tend to gravitate towards and it uh, seems folks tend to like it. And then the obvious leadership and advocacy project. So whatever it is that they're learning, learning about leadership, and then how can they get exposure experiences? Because that's really number one in supporting their personal and professional growth is exposure. And research shows that. Um, some more exposure experiences within my classes, specifically the counseling, the LGBTI plus community one again, I have them interview a professional in the field that works with queer folks. So, and then specifically, they can learn what maybe needs to be done yet in the field um, and what they also wanna continue to, as a professional integrating into their practices. And then they write a short reaction paper again, like two pages, we're, I mean, we're talking short and to the point, and this is graduate level, so it's fine, They're, they'll be fine. <laughs> they might complain about it, but it's fine. Um, so anyway, so that one is one they actually really like because now it's not just listen to me blabber for 50 centuries. Now it's let me talk to another professional in the field. So no matter if it's counseling, um, business, etc., that can be something that could be really impactful for your students. Um, and obviously attending events like this one or other celebrations, cultural events to increase your exposure experiences that typically will increase your affirming attitudes. Um, I cannot read whatever is written under there. But so in class time, in addition to assignments or creative tasks outside of that, well, you can be adding into your coursework too is case vignettes. Um, you can, uh, so that would be maybe um, they would, in business, they'd be working with a customer that, or a group that it maybe defines as queer or something like that, and how would you go about that process? I don't know anything about business, so I'm just making that up. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so what you want to do um, also is bring in peer life stories. So how can you engage the classroom to create that sense of community, set the tone for that first, so then there can be that open sharing of peer life stories and how that is influencing them as well. And this one's specific to more helping um, professionals, but being aware of your profession and what are the competencies that go with cultural sensitivity and how are you gonna demonstrate that in your coursework as well. That was really quick, so next. Mine's gonna be quicker. 
All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Billy Ulivari, and I'm an assistant professor of sociology. Um, where's the clicker? Um, and so <clears throat> what I teach in sociology is a lot of research methods, so qualitative research methods, um, how to do a research question, how to do an interview, how to construct interview questions. Um, and a lot of it has to do with how to um, create knowledge. And so when we're talking about querying research methods, I like to shift the frame a little bit to instead of creating it, um, acknowledging it, uncovering it, discovering it, right? It's there already. We're not creating it as the researcher. We're bringing it into relief. So um, what I have here are some ways to be thinking about how to discuss research methods in your classes. But I also mean, I mean, I'm from the social sciences, but these, these kind of principles translate into counselor ed and into the humanities. And we see a lot of the same, um, a lot of the same themes intentionality in identifying other um, experiences, being, um, you know, disrupting traditional biases and that kind of thing. So um, when I'm thinking of research methods, um, I think of the feminist principle of looking at how research methods up to now or, you know, previous research methods have um, reified and reasserted and, you um, Reinforced, that's the word. Reinforced a lot of biases. So when we think of any of the existing or much of the existing research on LGBTQ community, communities, <clears throat> um, it's based on the identity care category, like um, uh, transgender, heterosexual, bisexual. And then we kind of talk about these groups of people as a category. And so I, I feel like when we are querying our teaching, we are moving away from these identities as categories and more as experiences, right? And so our data collection needs to be embodied. It needs to embody the experience of the people we're talking about. So a lot of um, qualitative inductive research on queer communities ask questions like my first bullet point. What are the challenges faced by transgender youth? That's a legitimate research question. Um, I would critique it and be like, um, well, transgender youth is a very broad category. It includes people of different classes, people of different races, different, people, um, different religions, languages, all of that. Um, and so when we just kind of talk about the category, it does kind of lump a lot of people and in their experiences together. So I like to switch, um, I like to encourage my students to be thinking instead of what are they, what are the things, identify the things, ask how. How do people in this community do particular things? So how do young people navigate and express their gender identities in educational settings? So you are really um, talking about the process that uh, people experience as opposed to a blanket experience that we make uh, generalized to a whole category. So, um, and that's what I mean by identity politics. Um, it's very easy, especially in particular research designs, to just use these categories as a box to check. But we wanna be able to um, capture the experience of the people as opposed to just how do you identify, okay? Um, and so another way to do this, and I also want to be clear that none of these things that I'm discussing is particularly new or innovative. This may even be what we're doing already, um, but this is really about intentionality and design and highlighting and prioritizing particular things. Um, another, another way we can do this, and this is where I really kind of get to the point of we're not creating knowledge, but we are uncovering it, right? It exists, um, to center the voices who have been marginalized. So um, we want to highlight the importance of research questions that center on the experiences of the marginalized groups. Um, like within, like the marginalized groups, within marginalized groups, within marginalized groups, right? The interlocking systems that Dr. Sanders was talking about. Um, and so this really does kind of, um, and so when I, when, I, when I talk to my students about centering marginalized voices, they, it's things like first gen students, it's things like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, racially minor, minority groups who are, they don't see themselves very much in the research or kind of in society. So this really has to do with a prioritizing, 
right? Prioritizing of people's experiences that we don't already kind of know um, or that we would like to uncover more about. Um, and so I feel like this also can be translated into our other disciplines. Like instead of, you know, how does X affect Y, we can be like, how does this process work for this group of people or for this uh, identity? Um, and then finally, the idea of um, queering the normal, um, this one is actually my favorite one because I feel like this is one where we're, we're still struggling and I feel like even myself as a queer person also struggle. Um, queering the normal in terms of heteronormativity. Like that is like, um, like heteronormativity, monogamous marriage, those are still um, underlying structures that are largely unquestioned. So when we are trying to queer the normal, it's not just about asking the identities, right? Are you not straight? It's more like, um, how is your family structured? How are your relationships created? Because those things in experience are largely very, very different from other groups. And so <clears throat> I, I like to think of like the disruption that Dr. Sanders was talking about in terms of just let's just get rid of the assumption that there's the heteronormativity part, right? Um, the, the first slide that um, Nick had there talked about um, pedagogy for the uh, heterosexed, right? And I feel like that's one of the things that is still very much ingrained. Um, and so it's like when you're talking about families, when you're interviewing and you're asking about people's families, don't have the assumption that this is going to be a nuclear family or that everybody's going to be related by marriage or blood. You know, uh, as a queer, we don't always do that, right? We make up our own things and we make up our own structures and that's how we uncover. That's the information to uncover. Um, and so I think that's probably where I can leave it. Um, I just want to remind us that, again, this is neither new or original, but it is something that we do intentionally, deliberately, um, and it expands beyond just research, right? It's about reflection. It's about identifying um, biases that have been institutionalized. I mean, we talk about science and the scientific method as, as if it's an objective thing, right? But we know that it just kind of reinforces a lot of other norms. And so querying research methods, the way I see it is, let's just not have those norms. <laughs> let's, just, let's just say um, other stuff, right? Let's ask other questions. I think that's all I got. What do I have next? Um, what is this? We have some resources. <laughs> we have some resources um, on this PowerPoint that you might find um, useful when a student comes out to you. Also some um, uh, references for campus resources, how to best uh, support transgender students, information on inclusive bathrooms, and I feel like any of these, if you clicked on any of these, you would see a lot of the things that all three of us just talked about. Disruption, questioning the norm, um, mar uh, centering marginalized voices and embodying their experiences. Is there more? No. Yeah. And the Safe Zone Ally training is actually free online, even though we do have one uh, on campus, but let's just say you have online students who cannot get to campus. There is a free version that folks can take, and you can put it into your courses if you choose to partake in that. Um, yeah, there's nothing left on those resources. He shared it for me. Thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, so I know we did the quickest lightning talk. We tried, anyways. Um, and I, we really want you to be able to be reflective of what is maybe one thing you're taking away from today's very quick lightning talk. Whether it's something that you already knew and it's reaffirming to continue to practice or something that was completely new to you. If we can take a couple of minutes to, you can either ask questions or share um, like your one takeaway from today. Just kind of talking about how you're approaching all of, like, you know, queer theory and, and like I really like your part, like Billy, like not that I did, like everybody else's part, but what you're talking about um, how re you're reframing things to students. So my question is, and anybody can answer too, is how when you get pushed back, especially in today's day where we are kind of taking some step backs, how are you helping to reframe and encourage the students who have a very narrow mindset to think wider without like, 
you know, punching them in the face with it, right? You know, like, what are some, like, tactful approaches to that to kind of say, well, that's how do we expand this? Because I have some things, but I always am looking to get b better at that. I can start. Um, for my thought processes, specifically in counselor education, I can only, sp I'm going to speak for that. Um, we have specific competencies and standards we have to follow. So no matter what our personal value systems are, that are you aligning with what our profession is saying? And are you, are you following that? And if not, let's do some checking points with that. And how do we na navigate that? Um, so that's a way I can do that. But not all fields have competencies and those type of things, or when you're just working with students in general. So any other thoughts? <clears throat> I think I encountered that um, mostly in my intro classes. So Sandra's got graduate students, and they're like more professionalized. But I've got right out of high school students a lot of the time. And when I'm talking about sex and gender and just like the definitions that we talked about, you can like feel the, you can feel them bristling. Like you can just, everyone's blood pressure goes up. And so to handle it, like I have to uh, preface the discussion with, this is the sociological perspective. We ask questions like, what are you doing? Like, what are people doing? We ask about relationships. We ask about structures. Um, and we don't ask about what our thoughts are, right? We ask what is happening and what can we observe. Um, that's something we do on the first day of class, but when we start the sex and gender chapter, like we did today, we gotta bring it back because this is, um, I feel like, where the sociological perspective bumps right up against how a lot of people have been raised. And so in sociology, we talk about beliefs and we talk about perspectives. And essentially, I have to get to the point where I'm like, you have your beliefs, right? And then there's the sociological perspective. Um, they may not match, and that's fine, right? You can have two ideas in your head, but I'm really going to test you on the sociological perspective. Um, but I have to kind of make room, right? I have to make room. Um, I've had the experience where students um, push back. And, and like sometimes they'll push back, just like, can you clarify this? But sometimes they'll push back, like, there's only two genders, right? And I had that issue last semester where somebody wore a shirt on purpose that came in and said, there's only two genders. And I was like, well, you know, we just talked about intersex, right? We just talked about this. Um, and, he, and he didn't want to have the dialogue. He just wanted to wear his shirt, reassert his position, and then like walk out the door. Um, but it was like, we had to bring it back and be like, beliefs, sociological perspective, and they're different, and that's fine. Um, but I do feel, especially with this, I don't know if this is an SLV thing, but I've had to kind of go back to the learning objectives. Our objective here is to learn the uh, definition of these things. I'm not trying to change your mind. And so there is a little um, rope, tight rope walking that, that happens. One thing that, um, and I teach office um, intro, and that's the same approach I use, but in my upper div courses that I've tried that I find works pretty well is um, on the, in the first week of class, um, having the entire class, we come up with, well, we're, we're a community, you know, we are a group, we're a social group, and let's have, and although you said eradicate norms, which, you know, I'm all for, but what are our classroom norms? What's our classroom culture? And that doesn't come from me. That comes as a collective. So I have them think on it, marinate, come back. We talk about it. I put them in groups. It's, it's a process in which, and I'm writing on the board, and, I, and it always put in, um, students always say, respect. Right? They, want res they, they want to demonstrate respect for their peers, um, sometimes open mind, et cetera, et cetera. But um, pronouns are always part of that as well. And when students identify that they want their campus, their um, class group to be respectful, and that comes from them, and then it's written on the board, it's put in Blackboard, then that also becomes a way to anchor those kinds of conversations and that culture and that climate in the classroom. Well, you know, we've all agreed, you know, we've all voted on this. We all agreed. We've collaborated. This is a, this is a respectful, open space. If, if there becomes kind of that pushback, we can navigate those because we've all come together to create that, those classroom norms. So that's something that I've recently done, and it seems to work fairly well. So you rip the guy's shirt off? 
Well, these, this is upper div. So it's very a different, it's upper division are social majors. No, yeah. In, the intro courses, no, 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 no. No, we're, we're a respectful classroom. There are still going to be disrespectful people among that group. I'm just, I'm, I'm obviously pushing the limit is to, to what I'm saying, but yeah. what do you do when you still have that person? Well, in, in our syllabi in the sociology department, we have developed, and this is an inclusive classroom space, um, and this is what's tolerated and what's not, and teaching sociology, race, class, gender, uh, sexual orientation, I mean, we are the, probably the most radical here at Adams State in terms of what we teach. Um, you have to set those parameters and those guidelines of what constitutes um, what's appropriate in the classroom and what's not. Um, I also have my own statement, like Dr. Schneider's classroom culture and rules. Um, so far, I haven't had to ever, and hope, will never, rip someone's shirt off or punch them in the face. But um, there's been tense, situ tense, yeah, tense situations, but um, those have to be addressed in that moment and in a way that is um, reflective of all ideas. And then I have, a, I mean, I can go on, I could share it. Um, you know, I said, someone said, no, I won't go into it. There was an issue related to LGBTQ, and there was something that was said. <clears throat> I immediately said that language is not allowed in my classroom, um, and um, we, we will not use that in, in my classroom. That is a hostile and oppressive shutdown. Then I brought the student into my, my office, and we had a really wonderful conversation in which I learned where this person learned this word from, they didn't know where they're from, and we had a, a great dialogue um, that I think was, I hope, was a learning experience. But in that moment, it was, you may not use that word in my class. Yeah, Heidi, I really appreciate your um, proactivity. So a key part of that, so you're establishing those norms and all those things from the beginning, and then you can go back to it instead of the reactive, and then all of a sudden, like, there's more challenges that come with that. Absolutely. And one thing I think about, too, when you're working with students, that you have to also meet them where they currently are developmentally. Um, uh, so I, I think having those planting of the seeds, um, having those maybe individual level type of conversations, but, and we're not trying to change their belief systems, or maybe I am, but, um, I'm, Outwardly, I'm not trying to change. I'll, I'll tell them I'm not trying to change the belief systems. But I think there's that piece of how do we give them space to be reflective, like challenging of like, why do you believe what you do? What experiences in your life have impacted that? Those type of things. So and then it can help them reflect. That doesn't mean they're going to change absolutely anything, but at least it gives them that opportunity. And I think opportunity is the key word. the time we're run by limited exposure and um, fear so we can also name that too like because of maybe our limited exposure that we're fearful and then we have those immediate value systems or biases and trying to be open and curious to learning whatever that objective actually is now yeah. what are their questions thoughts or learnings from today I guess maybe a, just a thought or a question in thinking about the way that you've been talking about bringing all of this up in the curriculum and in the classroom. But as an educational institution where 
we've got all of these other dimensions. How do we try to bring this out more into other dimensions of the campus life, the campus experience, and the campus community? Do that one. Yeah, I mean, I think this was kind of my approach when I came in as CTIR director, right, was to kind of really center these as institutional values. Um, and I think a lot of the ways I like to approach this is even things that are not seen as like classroom curriculum still have curriculum, like learning is still happening in those spaces. Um, so I think about like the writing center or we think about like the library or I think about, you know, CTIR are spaces where folks are learning and doing and these kinds of things. And, and one thing I think that would be really useful is like a leadership institute that focuses specifically on queer feminist leadership because there's a whole a lot of research about how do you do this in a thoughtful and intentional way. Um, and I think this also kind of relates to a lot about like the Adams experience and like what that could possibly be, which is about, you know, we're, you know, I think there's a misconception with our undergrads that like I'm gonna go get a job in this very specific area of what I studied. And that might be true, but that probably is not true. And you're probably going to have 10 to 12 jobs. So, so you might want to think a little bit more about these different competencies and that you're probably going to work with a queer person at some point in time. So how do you center their experiences? And how do you interrogate your own why you do the things that you do and, and all those kinds of things? That's kind of where I kind of sit from like a, you know, an admin teacher kind of interspace. Hi, so I guess as a baby researcher, I thought it was really um, eye-opening the idea of uh, looking at more uh, specific questions rather than asking general uh, questions to students and their experiences, and I think particularly in STEM, we really need to look into those experiences since um, we tend to be very rigorous and close-minded in the sciences and I, I thought that was really interesting and right now I'm running a lot of psychological and sociological analysis on our students and I think maybe in order to look at the queer experiences in STEM we can maybe uh, apply some of those uh, questions or and ideas into our research. Um. I, I, I think that is pivotal. A lot of um, like the fields we're talking about, we often study human experiences. Like that's literally the thing that we study. But in STEM, you're studying other things. And so it, it's a little more difficult, I think, or it's less obvious to center these experiences of our marginalized groups. So um, I feel like that's where the next or the next opportunity for major changes because we've been in our disciplines it's been here for a little while but you know in stem and other fields because our assumption that everything is objective we leave a lot of that stuff out Anything else? and in every stage of research you can be thinking of like ethical and cultural considerations from the very beginning. Um, so I think that helps my lens when I do any type of research um, because in every stage I'm constantly reflective of um, the needs of whatever the population I'm um, researching with at that time. Um, but also, like, no matter if you're doing quant or qual or all the crazy things, um, at the end of the day, how are you being reflexive? is the, I think the key part um, and yeah and qual is just as rigorous as well um, it's actually pretty rigorous as a because of the real reflexivity it takes and to show the trustworthiness of our studies Back in the old days, when I was younger, um, you would bring in, someone would bring in a queer person. This is a queer person. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't even using that term, really. Um, or this is a trans person. Again, they weren't using that term. Or this is a queer trans person. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, well, God, this is a queer trans person who's bisexual or non-monogamous or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's like on display. Yeah, some questions about their experience, maybe. But what I'm hearing is you're studying deeper on the experiences 
uh, specific experiences and how they relate to other societal topics. Perhaps is that is that. Yeah, you're it's like going under, a, going down a layer or down two layers. Um, a lot of like the example you gave where we bring one person in and we ask them a bunch of questions and then that person is kind of like the representative of the whole group. And um, uh, the, the questions that we had, and it's back to reflectivity, reflexivity, um, when I say identity, I always think of it as a category, as a thing, as a ch box to check, kind of something simple. And we want to go beyond just the category and the letters in our acronym and really focus on what experiences go with those things. So when I say beyond identity politics, I mean like in terms of research, uh, put the experience first as opposed to the identity. Um, the identity's there, so put the experience first and then we'll be able to see how the identity kind of fits in other places. Yeah, another way to say that too, instead of going about trying to define something, whatever phenomena you're studying, you're trying to describe, looking at the contextual factors, the, the environments around that person, those type of pieces for a deeper, more reflective understanding of their lived experience. Anything else? All right, I think we're, I think, I think we're done. Woo. Let us know if you need me. Please take things as you leave. And just to clarify, um, Nick is going to send out the PowerPoint. And also, we have a bunch of folders. Within those folders, there's some articles related to teaching practices. I threw in a couple, like multicultural transformative pedagogy and like research articles. There's, there's not a lot of them, but there's a few. Feel free to take a look at them. Let us know if you ever have any questions.